The 25th anniversary of National Chemistry Week is upon us, and to celebrate, we visited the University of Maryland's Nano Center to talk to three chemists about their research in nanotechnology, which happens to be this year's theme for NCW. But before we dive in, Dr. Brian Eichhorn is going to talk to us about just exactly how small the nanoscale is. So the nanoscale is bigger than a molecule, which a molecule typically has about 5 to 50, sometimes 100 atoms, to nanoparticles that are a few thousand atoms to a few hundred thousand atoms. And that interface between molecules and nanoparticles is very interesting for science, but it also is changing a lot of the technologies that we use today. Dr. Eichhorn's work uses nanoparticles to create better batteries and fuel cells. One of the big issues with fuel cells is they require very expensive materials like platinum to be used as catalysts. Catalysts are basically substances that make chemical reactions happen faster. Eichhorn's research team is working at the nanoscale to create more efficient fuel cells with catalysts made out of cheaper and more abundant materials. So a fuel cell is a really cool thing. Here's an example of a very old one. This is about 10 or 11 years old. There's no moving parts. You simply put in hydrogen and oxygen on, into the cell and electricity comes out. So it's silent, there's no moving parts. This is an old platinum-based fuel cell that generates about 100 watts of power. So it could run a 100 watt light bulb, for example. And it has a lot of platinum in it. Very expensive, not commercially viable. So we're trying to get away from platinum, but in the meantime, we've been able to make new particles that go into these cells. Very small, a few thousand atom particles that use a lot less platinum in the actual catalyst. And now a cell this size today generates about a kilowatt, can run, a, in fact, a, a refrigerator, and has about a tenth of the amount of platinum. So they're cheaper, they generate a whole lot more energy, and in fact, they, uh, uh, they're now commercially viable and being sold. What we'd really like to do is make a catalyst out of iron or, or copper, something that's really, really cheap. And then, and then we don't care about how much we put in as much. But then all of a sudden, the, the economic barriers for getting these into the market disappear. Now, nanotechnology isn't only improving fuel cells, but it's also making big changes in some of the materials used in photovoltaic or solar cells. All solar cells contain semiconductors, which are essential components in electronics that control the flow of electricity. The semiconductors used in today's solar cells are made of silicon, which is expensive and has rigid physical properties. Dr. Root Roby is interested in organic semiconductors, which are made from common elements like carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Although these elements are cheap and abundant, they aren't commonly used due to their lack of efficiency. By studying the properties of organic semiconductors at the nanoscale, Dr. Root Roby's team figured out a way to create pathways for electricity to flow through. Think of it as paving roads out of nanostructures, but on these roads, the traffic isn't cars, but electricity. So the inorganic semiconductors are made of atoms, just atoms that are very crystalline, and organic semiconductors are made of molecules, mo very big molecules that are essentially nanoscale size. A great example of that is buckyball, or so-called so C60. They're lighter, they they're can be very flexible. People have known really since the 1970s that you could take certain organic molecules and you could actually use them to generate electricity from sunlight. The problem was that you couldn't make enough electricity to make it useful. But as people started thinking about how is the sunlight absorbed, when it's absorbed, how does it create electricity and how does that move through the material, they realized that the, the key to, to doing this was to create pathways through the material that were of nanoscale dimensions. You wanted nanoscale molecules, which are semiconductors, and then you wanted to pattern them almost like roadways so that they, they, they could conduct the electricity very efficiently. If you could do this, then you could suddenly make these devices that were truly efficient and could be useful. And applications for this um, might be solar cell jackets, uh, batteries and things that you can take out that are sustainable type battery materials. It's freaky to think like what kind of materials you're going to be using in 10 years, right? Because you, you, can, you only know what you're using now. Freaky indeed. But let's shift from buckyballs to nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes are another promising nanomaterial with super strength among several other intriguing physical properties. In fact, carbon nanotubes are so strong that scientists have speculated that they might just be the material needed to build an elevator into space. Of course, that's a long time coming, but there's a lot of other super cool applications just on the horizon. But first things first, researchers need to get a grip on the sticky, fickle material before it can be used for industrial applications. 
As a PhD student in Dr. Yu Hong Wang's lab, grad student Alex Brezina is hard at work developing techniques to control nanotubes, which could lead to applications in medicine, strengthening products like tires and helmets, and much more. This is a model of a carbon nanotube. A carbon nanotube is, well, it's a tube composed entirely of carbon, but its diameter is only about a nanometer wide. Carbon nanotubes are uh, extremely conductive, they're extremely strong, they can, uh, they can glow, they're fluorescent, they can conduct heat extremely well. Some of the challenges with carbon nanotubes is that they have the strong tendency to stick together. They form these clumps and bird's nests of fibers, and that's really challenging when you want to scale up these materials for industrial applications. So we have to find ways to sort of pull the carbon nanotubes apart, induce order into the system. And that's always a challenge with these kinds of materials because they're just so small. Some of the applications people have considered is filling them with, say, an anti-cancer agent and uh, dispersing them in the body in order to fight cancer or to use them as uh, little fluorescent tags in the, in the body so that we could see where the cancer is. So carbon nanotubes in their natural state have a tendency to clump together. And if, say, we wanted to use these materials for biomedical applications, you really don't want to be injecting anything that, that clumps up so badly and, and becomes these little bundles. What we'd prefer instead is to use a solution of carbon nanotubes, where we have carbon nanotubes that actually dissolve in water. Only in that instance would I be willing to inject this material into my body. So my research is really looking at the fundamentals of carbon nanotubes and so that we can better understand them and bring them out of the lab and into the real world. As you can see, this is a really exciting time for nanotechnology as researchers pave the way for innovations in medicine, energy, and materials. We at Bite Size Science hope you have an excellent National Chemistry Week. If you're interested in carbon nanotubes, check out this video of Alex and her colleagues demonstrating how to pull a thread from a carbon nanotube forest 